just one little thought for today, if I may. The reading today from the prophet Isaiah it begins with this line, I, the Lord your God, teach you what is good for you. Teach you what is good for you. I'm not sure what your experience was in uh, primary school, secondary school, but we would rarely or never actually have, have thought of Jesus as a teacher, or at least as someone who could teach us. Uh, the Jesus that we were presented, he was obviously um, friendly, loving, very good at finding sheep. Um, he would preach to people, make them feel nice, and uh, then he loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. But the idea of him teaching, and even though we would have said that yeah, Jesus, you know, back in the day he would have taught, you know, he would have uh, taught his uh, apostles um, as a 12 year old, there he is discussing, preaching, well, discussing and maybe teaching the, uh, the priests of the day uh, in the temple, even as a 12 year old. But the idea that Jesus can teach you and I, the, the idea that Jesus can teach me, that I was definitely never taught. Uh, it, it just it, it was, it's a far it was a foreign thing. The way we were educated, if you will, and this isn't out to be giving out to my uh, poor teachers back in the day, but that was probably the way they were taught to teach us. So, uh, but was that basically God has His way of doing things, and we have have our way, and we have you know our own truths, and if you believe something firmly enough. It's true. And if enough people believe something passionately enough, then, then it's, it's even more true. But truth is just completely, when it came to moral things, when it came to scientific things, it's very clear. When it came to moral things, truth is just very, very vague. Because whatever you made it up to be. So the idea like that God, not just that Jesus not just taught back in the day 2,000 years ago, but that Jesus can teach you and I today <laughs> that might actually be news to us. And Jesus still has this teaching authority to this day. Okay, so how does he teach us? Uh, we'll just name three today. Uh, so he teaches us through scripture. So through scripture we hear clear answers to certain questions. You know what I mean? Lord, what must I do to attain eternal life? Uh, or... We see how, how Jesus behaves, how Jesus is merciful, how like uh, even the guy who converts at the 11th hour, 59th minute, the good thief beside Jesus, you know, that he repents. Lord, bring me with you to paradise. Okay. And Jesus promises him that he will be in paradise with them. So we, we we're learning something about God, we're learning, some, learning something about how Jesus is merciful. We're learning something about his heart. Okay, so he teaches us through scripture. He teaches us through the teachings of the church. This is a little more contentious one. But the Holy Spirit continues to work through the church. So even though uh, the people in the church may be imperfect, in fact, the people in the church are imperfect, that's why we need a church. Uh, we're imperfect. But the teachings of it remain divinely inspired, they're given to us by God. So can God teach us through them? Absolutely. <clears throat> the last way I think is important to focus on uh, in which Jesus teaches us is in our own hearts. Okay, So <clears throat> if we're avoiding sin, especially if we're avoiding mortal sin, then the Holy Spirit lives in us. Okay, And that, that, that presence of the, of, of the Trinity within us uh, it's not passive. It's not. In, it shouldn't be in some wee corner uh, of, of, of some dark recess of our heart. But God lives there. The Trinity lives at the indwelling of the Trinity is what we have. So from that place, then the the the, the innermost being of each one of us, Jesus can and does teach us. We mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I think it, it, is, it is important to, to reiterate uh, that many times we know what's right and wrong, not because someone actually taught us. It's all, we, we would probably call it kind of instinctual. We just seem to know, of course, that's wrong. 
But where does that knowledge of right and wrong, wrong, right and wrong come from? Like, no one ever had to sit me down and explain to me why abortion was wrong. You just, you just know. And that's why the pro-choicers know it, and we know it, but no one really says it so openly. But there's a strong, strong link between being pro-life and being Christian. At all the pro-life marches that we would have gone to, there were mainly, mainly Catholics, but a lot of our, our, our Christian brothers were there, Christian brothers and sisters were there as well. Because there was this, there was this strong association between these two. It's, it's not, not, you, you can be atheist and be pro-life as well, absolutely. But for the most part, uh, at least in my experience, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my experience, um, those who are most avidly pro-life are also good Christians. Why is that? Because, well, if, if, if God lives within us, we've been baptized, we have this, we have this, this, this grace of, of God living within us, then it illuminates our conscience. So it helps us to see right and wrong, even though someone hasn't actually taught it. You just know. You just know that something, that this action is wrong, this action is right. And sometimes it's going to be kind of frustrating because you can't necessarily explain it, you can't necessarily put it into words, but you just know. It's plain obvious. Uh, and this is all another way in which the Lord teaches us. So within our hearts, different circumstances come up. Or maybe even different temptations, right? And we know how, how temptation works as well. It, uh, it's subtle and it looks, it, looks, it looks inviting. And then it doesn't look so bad really. I mean, when you consider that there are mass murderers out there. So what's this little sin? This little sinucho here? You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't matter. It's, just, it's insignificant. The grand, the grand history of the universe. This little sin here, what difference does it actually make? You know, and you've done it before anyway. And the priest forgives you every time. So, you know, and then it just becomes a little more enticing. Then even before the sins, like the, oh, the pleasure in the sin. Oh, I remember when I used to do that. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Oh, well, bad boy, me, what? Mm-hmm. You know, and just you were kind of taking pleasure in the temptation before you've actually even sinned. That's where Francis of Sales would say, that's where you win the battle. You know, you, you, not even, it's not just not giving in to the sin, but even the, the pleasure of the temptation. <laughs> Renounce that, and it'll never become an action. It'll never become a sin. Renounce the, 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 the pleasure of the temptation. Anyway, the Lord in, 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 that's why the Lord speaks so much about the heart, you know, the heart. This is where the Lord works. And then when, when the Lord lives there, and this divine light flows into us, it illuminates the truth and the falsity of what is presented to us. It illuminates the, the truth and the falsity of who we are. And that, that can be surprising in both directions. Maybe we're much better than we actually thought. And maybe there are actually more areas of our lives that are changing than we thought. But this divine life within us shows us. It shows us the truth. It's like a, a, a preparation for our final judgment. You know, when we will see God as he is in all of his truth and beauty. And I don't, I don't think you'll have to like, take out a book and go through all that we've done and not done. It's simply all present. And in this divine light, you simply see yourself as you are. I don't think there'll have to be a big discussion or anything. You'll simply see yourself as you are in the truth of, of our existence. And then there's that reality. Do I want God? Do I want him or not? Do I want his forgiveness or not? Do I want to be in his presence for all eternity, or would I prefer to be separated from him and hold on to my sin? Which is it? But it's just, again, it's, it's, all, all, all of this happens just in, in, in the presence of God with our soul, as it is, illuminated. So I think that, that begins already here. As God lives in us, he's, he's illuminating our soul to recognize right from wrong, giving us the grace then to choose right and avoid wrong. The Lord still teaches us to this very day. He teaches you, and he can, and he should, and he has the right to. Which means that we should be formable, not formidable, formable. We should allow ourselves to be formed by the Lord, who continues to teach. And never get to the point where, because we're going to the occasional prayer meeting in Mass every weekend, or because we go to a certain pilgrimage every year that you know, we're more or less we're good like. 
No, allow the Lord to continue to teach you. Allow the Lord in your own heart and in your own life to, to, show, the, to show you the greatness of his heart, to show you the depths of our need for him, to show you the greatness of his grace, to show you how that can be applied in daily circumstances. The Lord continues to teach us, and we need it. So we pray that these words of the prophet Isaiah, the words that God revealed to him, that they may be true in our lives. I, the Lord your God, I teach you what is good for you. I lead you in the way that you must go. If you only had been alert to my commandments, your happiness would have been like a river, your integrity like the waves of the sea. Amen.